Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Aaron Jones. I've pastored in the Mansfield area for a while, uh, in the Columbus area for a while. So uh, I've been Grace Brethren my whole life, or as they like to say now, Karis. Uh, whether you're on that wagon or not, we're still a body, we're still united. Uh, and it's a privilege to be able to speak here today uh, and to be able to bring the truth of God's word. It changes lives, amen? amen. And God has done an amazing work among us to those who have opened their hearts to allow the spirit to work in your life. Even this week, we can see where God has done a miraculous work, amen? amen. All right, well, I'm excited to, to get started. Before I do, I feel it's necessary to make my wife feel uncomfortable. So if everybody can leave my wife, this is my wife, Holly. Um, we have three girls and uh, 12, 9, and 3, and so they're kind of in the back there doing something. I don't know what they're doing, but they don't know what I'm doing either, so it's fair. Um, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit of the reason why I wanted to share a little bit about us is because I feel like every time I'm asked to, to be a guest speaker somewhere, nobody really knows anything about me. So I wanted to share this truth with you this morning because, or this, this bit about me, because this passage resonates within my life. My life was drastically changed in a similar way as the church of Thessalonica, as their lives were. And, and so it's an encouragement to say to you that your lives can be changed in the same way that theirs was, that mine was, if you do the following things that we're going to study. That's supposed to draw you in and be excited about the message. So let's, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And as you turn there, I want to share with you a story from Greek mythology. And you're probably thinking, boy, why did we ask this guy to come, right? Greek mythology, can we talk about that in church? Yes, but only as a negative example. Fair enough? Okay, so there's a young boy named Icarus. You may be familiar with the story. The story goes that Icarus had wings that were made of feathers and wax, and he was able to fly. As many of you have probably imagined when you were a kid, thinking, boy, what would it be like to be able to fly like an eagle, right? Well, Icarus was able to do that, but it came with a caution. His, his dad told him, listen, the one thing you've got to watch out for is don't fly too close to the sun because your wings are made of wax. And if you do, they'll heat up and melt and the feathers aren't strong enough to hold you and you'll crash into the sea and die. So the young boy sets off and I'm filling in the blank, taking some liberty with the story, but I'm sure just like any other bird learns to fly, there's some quirky, odd parts to begin with. But then he kind of catches himself and he begins to ascend and descend and be able to see himself riding up and down and taking great joy in this newfound gift that he has in flight. All the while, he's getting further and further out of the range of his father's voice saying, don't fly too close to the sun. And as you can imagine, he ascends and descends and ascends again, and he flies too close. The sun heats the wings and he crashes, all the while his father watches with great disappointment. It's such a good story for hope. <laughs> it's not a good story for hope. I told you that because now after I preach my message, you're like, well, it's better than Icarus's story, so that's good. No, I tell you that because this, I, I hear a lot of Christians say similar things about their walk with the Lord. Then you'll hear them say things like, you know, I try to do what God wants me to do. I really do. But then, you know, things kind of happen. You know, the thrills of life seem to push in and seem to push me further and further away from the voice of God. And suddenly I just get struck down and I just seem to be crashing and burning all the time while God just sort of sits there and looks at me like this. That's how they feel. And it always seems to end the same way where they finish telling me this, only to say, there must be something else I can do. The question for you this morning is, have you ever felt that way? Maybe you feel that way now. Maybe it's sin in your life that has gone on for years and years and you haven't been able to resolve that. Maybe it's overcoming temptation. Maybe it's learning how to be the spiritual leader of your home or submitting to your husband in your home. And, and it's just like, you know, I, I, I wrestle with this. I don't want to do it. I try, but then I, I just, I, I fall short and I fail every time. Maybe it's a new sin in your life, right? Like you get a new neighbor 
and they, they don't have a political bumper sticker that you agree with, and their dog keeps using your lawn, and so you do what every Christian does, is that in the middle of the night you sneak over there, you put your party sticker on their sticker, and then you rub their waist on his, on his car, right? Everybody does that? Nobody does that? See, the last church I preached at, I got a lot of amens. So good for you guys. That's good. Don't do that. But regardless of what it is, we know what it's like to struggle and to wrestle and to wonder how are we going to overcome this. In the text that Paul talks about, he says the, the similar thing that there, Paul's requesting the church to walk in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. And, and you'll see that this is made possible through the work of Christ, but also through the word of God and through the Spirit's power within the people, the individual, the church. And so while they're doing many things right, Paul knew that there was still potential within them to, to sin again. And so he says, I want you to do all the more. And so Paul exhorts the body of Thessalonica to draw upon their position with God and to overcome their flesh. And this is known as sanctification. So you might have looked at the title and been like, sanctification, that's a big, long, stuffy word. What's that about? Essentially, that's what it is. Being given access to power and the presence of God to overcome the sinful flesh, to have been set apart to a relationship with God that's unique to only believers. And so the idea is still true today. We have the ability to act independent of God. Amen? Nobody has to question that. But the texts like this, sometimes we read them and we read it as do better, try harder, man up, lady up, right? Do whatever it takes to just keep doing it in your own ability and in your own strength. And it can feel overwhelming and just honestly daunting, right? So what we miss in a passage like this is our posture before God, but also understanding the purpose and understanding which person to focus on in our trials. When we understand those things, then we can be successful. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. The question I have for you before we get started is this. Is the way that you're dealing with sin pleasing to the Lord? Is the way that you're dealing with sin pleasing to the Lord? Because it was in the church of Thessalonica. And it can be for you and I. Let's, let's get into this passage after we pray. Lord, I just ask that our hearts be open to your word, to your prompting and your spirit. That, Lord, this message is very much for the believer who has toiled again and again and again, trying to fix their own life, wanting it for the right reasons, but maybe going about it in the wrong way. So, Lord, I just pray that each individual would have their, their hearts open, their eyes open to your word, and that your spirit would confirm these truths within them, that they would be able to see it in their own context and understand for themselves how to gain ground over sin that may be having taken root years ago and is still controlling, still dominating their lives. Lord, move with your power. This morning we ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you're a note taker, I believe there's some notes in your bulletin that you can follow along. I'm not a note taker, so if I don't see you writing anything down, I'm not going to point you out or blame you, okay? But if you like following notes, there's three simple decision statements I've got. The first one is this. Sanctification begins with right posture. Sanctification begins with the right posture. Look at verses 1 through 2. It says this. Finally, and I'm reading in the ESV, it says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul reveals a couple of things in this passage that I think is worth taking notes on. It's, it's probably worth highlighting, if nothing else. And the first is this. There is a walk that is pleasing to the Lord. 
So if you're discouraged, saying, I don't feel like my life really lines up well. I don't know that God's pleased with my life. There is a walk that is pleasing. And beyond that, he says, there's a way to excel at it even more, which should bring us more hope. And it's, and it's more than a walk. It's God's will. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, that just means beyond just you wanting it, God wants to ordain it to be so. So he's pulling for you. That should be an encouragement to us. What was it about this church that made them so successful? Well, Paul, Paul said that their ability to overcome all that they had came from their understanding of the instructions that they received and the commands that were given to them. Now, for the sake of time, we don't have the opportunity to go into Acts 17, but if you want to uh, mark in your Bibles or, or put, the place, put your finger in mark, or Acts chapter 17, read it later today. This is the passage where the church of Thessalonica came about. And it's full of amazing hardship and great struggle, social struggles that this church was birthed and people were given life and people were redeemed through it. Uh, but in that, the instructions by Paul were given there that Jesus was the Messiah. This is kind of your synopsis. Jesus was the Messiah who died and rose again to live for all who believed in him, that they would have life and that they would be able to have liberty over their sins, and that they would be able to be empowered to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples as the Great Commission commands us. And so it's imperative to know that the gospel that they heard changed their lives in such a way that they were able to then be a testimony to other people who would look and say, man, just four months ago, you were not this person. How did you see such life change? Oh, through the word of God. Let me show you, right? Their willingness to submit to the word of God postured them in such a way that they could receive the Holy Spirit. And, and they overcame quite a bit. If you're in 1 Thessalonians 4, turn back to 1 Thessalonians 1 real quick. I want to read this quickly to you. But this, this deals with the personal ability to overcome as we see here, it says in verse 2, we gave thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, this is important, but in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in full conviction. You know what kind of men that we proved to be among you for the sake, for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, or imitators of us and the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So their lives were radically changed in such a way that the Spirit of God moved in their lives in ways that were intoxicating to other people. That they said, well, tell me about this change. How do you have it? What, what, how did you get it? How do I get it? And they became witnesses to Macedonia and Achaia. But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything for you for they themselves concerning or they themselves show those things concerning you. And he goes on to say that they were able to overcome their idol and their immorality through this gospel and through the power of the Spirit of God. Now, I'm convinced, and I don't think I'm crazy, I'm convinced that God still wants to powerfully change lives today. Amen? Amen. And I believe his spirit is still at work and his word has still or still has all the authority that it had in Acts chapter 17. Amen. Amen. And so I believe that what we should see as a body of believers, the universal church, is that we should be living radically changed lives, liberated from sin in such a way that everybody says, I want to know about your Jesus. Isn't that always what we try and do? We try and figure out and scheme ways to try and share the gospel with people. When sometimes our lives are good enough to be a testimony to say, I want what you have. Because you are a changed individual. And so by humbling themselves to the instructions of God, 
they were able to do this through two things. But I, I want to give you an illustration of the first. When I talk about posture, posture matters. How many of you had a mom that said, you know, sit up straight, elbows off the table? No? Okay, good. I didn't either. So if you meet with me sometime, you'll notice I'm a slob. But, but posture matters. It certainly matters to God. Let me give you an example. I like football. And there are some big guys, probably my size, that, that play football. And they, they're the linemen, right? They're the guys that are on all their hands and, and, and feet are all dug into the ground and they're, they're leaning over themselves because they're trying to position themselves. They're trying to get in a posture that enables them to, at, the, at the, the movement of the ball, that they can take their big meaty legs and thrust forward as fast as they can and as hard as they can to impact the guy across from them, right? And that if you want to make a big collision with somebody, that's the right posture to be in. <laughs> if you're playing soccer, that's a terrible position to be in. <laughs> You're not going to be able to dribble the ball behind you when you can't really see under you, right? It's just not going to work. So oftentimes what happens is the church tries to posture themselves like the world so as to try and somehow win favor. And we stop posturing ourselves like the church that we're called to be so as to win favor. And then we end up wondering why we're not effective. So here's how we posture ourselves, knowing that the Spirit of God uses the Word to align us with His desire. That's the spiritual posture, if you will. But it came this way. It says in verses 1 and 2, if you want to flip back there in chapter 4, you'll notice that it says this, that they receive the Word and that they know the Word. That the way that we posture ourselves comes first through humility. Because we have to humble ourselves to this word and say, I'm going to have my life fit within its statements. I want my life to reflect what it says. I need to receive it and know its word in my heart. But beyond just humbling ourselves to receive and know the word, there's also a level of submission to the word that's necessary. And that's seen when he says, that they were submitting their lives to the authority of Christ. That a follower of Jesus needs to submit our lives to the authority of Christ. But what do I mean by that? Well, it's not hard to see in culture. It's not even hard to see in our own Christian circles. Where we'll read a passage, and a lot of times, pastors, Bible, you know, the, the small groups, whoever it is, um, they'll look at the text, and they'll try harder to explain why it doesn't say what it says, than just living with the reality of this is what God's word says. Let's do what it says. Why? Because I couldn't see myself submitting to a God that would insist I live like this. Humility and submission is absolutely crucial to your success in overcoming your sins. If we look at the word of God and we say, well, I know that, that I should be doing life this way. But come on, that was 2,000 years ago. I mean, culture has changed quite a bit. And if I want to be relevant, then I need to start thinking more open-minded and start to see this as closed-minded. It's not. Listen, it's not closed-minded at all. It's very inclusive. God has a plan for sinners. God has a plan for those who he's called according to his purpose. God has a plan for the world. And it hasn't changed. The question is, are you willing to submit to it or not? Because the word says that God opposes the proud. He gives grace to who? Me. The humble. And as long as we're going to the word saying, mm, boy, that one's, I don't like that verse. And you start to explain it away, you're really revealing your own heart. You do not have a submissive heart. Yeah, but society says, society says it's no longer about male and female being united as one. And it's no longer about, it's no longer culturally relevant for, for couples to wait until they're married or to live together once they're married. Well, I know the Bible says these things, but 
you know, for me, I think, and we're not submitting ourselves to the word of God. Listen, I told you that there's parts of this passage that has changed my heart. There's parts of this passage that have absolutely laid me flat, and, and, I'm a, and I can be a very proud person. Sometimes I read a passage like that, and, and I just immediately want to turn away and be like, I can't believe it's telling me this. I get mad sometimes because God seems to always find a way to expose my heart in his word. And sometimes the result is just let me shut the book and just, uh, you know what, I'll figure out why that doesn't mean that later. Is that you? What if God was really to say, this is how I want you to live your life? But I don't always like that. But I'll give you one of the greatest examples. One of, I love this story about Jesus. It's, it's quickly becoming my favorite story of Christ. Because in the moment that we see it, there's always this argument. It's, a, it's called the hyperstatic union. But it's this dealing with the difference between you know, God, Jesus as, as deity and Jesus as humanity or this human being you know, living in humanity. And, 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 and the balance between the two. <coughs> And the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane, I think, is one of my favorite stories because it begins to speak about how Jesus was agonizing. I mean, you see a picture of Jesus in his human state struggling with the awareness of what was going to happen. In other words, it's really easy for us to be like, well, yeah, but he's God, so it wouldn't have mattered, right? Listen, he knew what was going to happen to him, and he knew physical pain once he became a man. So he had stubbed his toes on the rocks through the trails of Jerusalem, just like every other walker would have. He knows what pain is like, and he knows the excruciating pain, although he doesn't know it firsthand. He can see, as others were crucified, that does not look pleasurable. And so he's agonizing in his human being. His, his human nature is saying, Lord, if there is any way that you could do it differently, could you hear my heart now and do it? And it would have been a radical thing. We would not have a church today if he had said, in fact, I can't believe that you would even think to want to kill me. So I'm going to go my own way. Is that how he responded? No, he said, but nevertheless, your will be done. I love that passage because it shows us it's not unhuman to disagree in our hearts because of fear or other emotions of what God may be doing in your life. But it's unacceptable to say, I'm going to live in those feelings and reject your truth. And that is what it means to be humbled and to be submissive to the word of God, to posture yourself in such a way. So when you read the word, you need to go to it saying, this is, this is a, a opportunity for me to draw upon God's word for my life and to align myself with his word so that I can be effective. It's an opportunity for me to surrender my will to the Father so that I again and again and again my actions are like his. And so when we do that, when we humble ourselves and we submit to Christ, we place ourselves in a posture in order to be sanctified. Which brings us to our second point. If you're taking notes, sanctification only happens when we understand its purpose. This one's, you got to really stay with me this one because we're going to get in it a little bit. In, in 3 through 6, it says this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles or heathens who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, and he will, or as we told you beforehand, and earnestly or, and solemnly warned you. Okay. 
What is sanctification anyway? We talked about it a little bit in the opening. Um, as Pastor Russ said, uh, the word sanctification, hagiosmos, is the Greek word, and it, and it has two twofold meaning. To be set apart is the idea, right? Holiness is set apart to unholiness. We are set apart in a relationship with God, separate from the world. So there's there's two sense, or there's two parts of this. First is the declarative sense. The declarative sense is similar to Psalms three or Psalms 4, rather, which says this, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. I've declared to do this. This is what God wants to do. And then it goes on to say, the Lord hears when I call him. Why? Because he is set out to have a oneness with you. Okay? So that's the declarative sense, but it, there's also a practical sense, and that speaks to the relationship. In, in 1 John 4, 4 through 6, it says, You are of God, my little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That is highly relational, right? I mean, in other words, if you have heartburn, your neighbor doesn't feel it, but you do, right? It's very personal because it's in you, right? I'm not trying to liken the Holy Spirit to heartburn. I'm trying to do there. That's not my intent. But, but know this. That they are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God hears us not. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, God has declared that he is going to set us apart. And he's also chosen to dwell within us so that we can know we are set apart and in that have power over things. So Paul uses the word sanctification to teach us a couple things. One, he wants to dwell in us. As believers, he does dwell in us. Second, he is accessible to his people. Believers should never say, I don't know what God really wants in my life. That's a choice that we make. That we are to be vessels used to contain the presence of God. And finally, that our lives are to be radically changed because of the driving power and the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Meaning, in other words, we should be gaining ground over sin in our lives. We should be finding ourselves victorious rather than victims. Again and again, we find this happening. But oftentimes what happens is we, uh, we, we mistake the purpose for why we're going through something or why we're dealing with a struggle, temptation, a sin, whatever it is. I'm a fan of the TV show Monk. Maybe you guys have seen that or, or not. It's, it's an older show. It doesn't really matter. But at any rate, it involves a, the main character is a, is a gentleman who has um, uh, OCD and, and he meets with a psychiatrist on a regular basis to help him work through these things. And, and in one session with the psychologist, he's talking about a time that was really scary to him. And he's asked to elaborate on it. He says, well, I was in a room. It was a very cold room. And he says, I just remember shaking. And he said, I was, I was scared. I was really afraid. He says, my, my mom was there and she was weeping. And, and he said, there was this man with a mask. And he was there. And he grabbed hold of me. And he lifted me by my ankles, and he, and he was hitting me. And the, the psychiatrist kind of stops him and is like, I think you're recalling your childbirth. <laughs> and he's like, you think so? And so they start to unpack that, that that's in fact what it was. The man with the mask was a doctor. He was cold because he was naked. He was, you know, I, I don't know that you can actually recall your childbirth, but the point is, the, the point is this. Sometimes we mistake the reason for why we're in something, right? Sometimes we misdiagnose the situation for what it really is. It's a beautiful moment, but he was scared to death. And I think the same thing is true. We oftentimes misunderstand sanctification for what it really is. We tend to make sanctification about what can I do? What box can I check? Uh, when trials hit and things come upon us, we don't always posture up under the word of God. Oftentimes we're like, Okay, I got this. We're going to try this one more time. Good old strength of Aaron, God. I, just watch this. 
and we find ourselves falling and led away by the passions of our hearts. And I, I think it's fair to say that if you're honest with yourself, don't raise your hand, but how many times have you said that to yourself? Where you, I'm going to overcome this this time, and then <sighs> here I am again, feeling like a fool and, and wondering why does God still love me? And does God still love me? I bet he's probably disappointed in me. But if you try and do it the other way, it doesn't work. I'm just going to try and avoid sexual immorality, and somehow maybe then I'll draw near to God. Let me ask you, does that work? You know it doesn't work. Because you've tried. So further proof is this. Paul tells them that they're walking in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. And that they're to do it all the more. So if it's about you sinning less and less to somehow gain this status of sanctification, then is God satisfied with some of your sin? Does God take pleasure in sin? Not at all. So let's say you sin seven days a week. Let's say, I mean, let's, let's say you're, you're wrapped up in uh, pornography on the internet. And you say to yourself, man, you know what, I'm going to try this time, I'm going to be better. Uh, I'm going to shoot for three days of not being on the internet. Is God satisfied with you sinning four days a week? No. If, if that were the case, he could not say to the disciples and the church of Thessalonica, hey, uh, you're doing great, I want you to do better. He would say, you're not there yet. <laughs> There's a better for you, and you should really posture yourself in a way to start obeying the word of God and be victorious over the sin in your life. So how do you abstain from immorality and yet do so all the more? If it's about you doing works. And the reality is, you can Here's the tip. Look at verse 5. Paul, Paul shows his hand here. He says, not in the passions of the lust, like the Gentiles or the heathens. In other words, did they have sin in their lives? You betcha. Did they live ungodly lives that were impure before a holy God? You betcha. Why is it that they can't overcome it? If it's something that you can do in your own will, why don't they do it? And the answer is seen right after. Who do not know God. In other words, they can't overcome their sin and shortcomings because they don't know God. But you know God. He says, so you can do this. You can overcome the sin. And so the Gentiles failed to be victorious over their sins because they did not know God. But if you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and trusted in the Father's work through Christ, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, and you are empowered. You are set apart so that you can be victorious. And so the purpose of sanctification is to draw near to God and allow His holiness to guide you through life. I'll give you another illustration. I love the story of Isaiah when he comes into the temple. It's a great, if you, if you recall, he's having this vision of the Lord, and it says the Lord's presence filled the temple, and the train of his robe was laid out before him, and there's all these, you know, seraphim flying around, and, and there's just this great, magnificent scene with all these great pillars, and the holiness of God was filling the temple, and all he could do in the holiness of God was fall flat on his face, posture, fall flat on his face, and when God said, who will I send, he says, Lord, send me. What he didn't say was, this place looks pretty awesome. I bet I'd like to be king here. Who to send? Why don't you go and I'll watch this great place you have here? Why didn't he say that? Why didn't he say, your sound system's killer? I mean, it sounds like thunder every time you talk. Have you heard this place? It's incredible. Because that would have been sin. That would have been idolatry. And before a holy God, that's not how people respond in the presence of the holy God. They fall on their face and they want to behave holy because he is holy. And if you want to overcome your sin, stop trying to make the purpose about you doing better before ever watching God and start drawing upon God's presence and his holiness because that, in effect, will allow you to be able to escape the sin in your life. 
And so in other words, it's really more about the presence of God and his holiness that results in our ability to live a holy life. Instead of trying to overcome your sin on your own, remember this. Freeing yourself from the act of sin does not draw you nearer to God. But if you draw near to God, you will be freed from your sin. Does that make sense? So that's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to just say, fix it, and then I'll be a part of your life. Quite the opposite. I want to be a part of your life so I can fix it. We've got to unlearn that I can fix this stuff on my own. I'll overcome it. I'll be good. I'll do better. I'll try harder. I won't do this this time. I'll put boundaries in my life and start drawing upon the person of God and his spirit through his word. Third statement is this. Sanctification only works when we focus on the right person. And this is kind of obvious at this point. But, and I won't belabor this too much, but seven says this, for God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. So again, sanctification only works when we focus on the right person. Verse seven and eight really serves as a warning. What's the warning? Well, if you go it alone, you're not only going to fail, but you're essentially rejecting God. <laughs> I have a three-year-old, as I mentioned, and, and she's a little headstrong. I don't know where she gets it. <laughs> but she, uh, the other day, she was on the uh, TV, and she had gotten the remote, and she had just messed it all up, right? And I walk in, and I see, I mean, she's deep into layers of this smart TV, and she, there's, you know, so I'm like, well, here, honey, let me help you. And I, and I go to her, and immediately, she, like, pushes herself in between me and the remote. It's like, no, I can do it. Now, there's no way she's going to be able to do it because she doesn't even, she doesn't even know how to read. And she's on a different input. She's in layers of stuff. I think she's about to change the language at that point. <laughs> and so, <laughs> listen, sometimes we do that to God. We say, I, I can do this. I can do this. And we're rejecting the help of God. And listen, he will let you do that. Now, unlike God, I didn't want her messing up my TV, so I kind of <laughs> got the remote from her hands. But God's not going to do that to you. He wants a humble heart that submits. And to understand that when I go through a trial, it's about Him. God wants to help you overcome the sin in your life. So not only is it kind of a, a, a means in which it's a warning, but it also serves as a great protection because He wants to encourage our hearts with his love and his truth. Let me, let me share these thoughts real fast. God wants to help you overcome the sin in your life. Amen? He wants to see you liberated from the immorality of your flesh. Amen? And here's the thing. God is pulling for you. He's not rooting against you. As much as we want to make it about, boy, God's just disappointed in me. It's said in there that this is his will. God isn't messing around. God has chosen a relationship with his church, his believers. God has chosen to place the spirit in you. And God has chosen to be accessible to you in whatever way you need to be victorious over sin in your life. The question is, will you allow him? If you make the purpose and the focus about you, you're not just rejecting him, but you're also rejecting the encouragement that comes with it. Because he's rooting for you, not against you. You see, God, I said it before, God doesn't want you to fix your life so that you can finally have a relationship with him. He wants you to draw near to him so he can fix your life. And in doing that, others will say, man, you are a radically changed person. How is that? Because I have a supernatural, all-knowing Holy Spirit that dwells within me because I place my faith in Christ. Can I tell you about that, God? And you guys will be change agents for this whole area of action. I believe that. But we need to understand the purpose of sanctification is to draw near to God. It only happens when we give God control and invite him into the situation. So whether you're tempted by anger at your neighbor or you're lusting after your <coughs> wife or you're, you're, you're uh, frustrated about 
situations that's causing you to sin in your own home or sin in front of other people, just know this. Instead of seeing it as a test, see it as an opportunity to allow God into your home and into your life and into your heart. Know the Word of God. I can't tell you how hard it is to memorize a scripture on anger when you're angry, right? Aren't you the same way as I'm? Like, I don't want to hear that verse. But if I have it committed to memory before I get angry, boy, it's a lot easier to draw upon, and it's a lot easier for the Holy Spirit to align me to be successful. Do you feel like you're a disappointment to God? I know I've hit on this before, but I just I want to emphasize this so much because it couldn't be further from the truth. Those of you who have placed your faith and trust in Christ, this message is largely to the church. If you're a visitor here, I'd encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, there's so much to know. It's, he's so worthy to know. It, it's, it's amazing the oneness you can have with the creator and sustainer of all life. But this message is for those who call themselves followers of Christ. So that we can, as a body, understand the truth of God's word. You are not a disappointment to him. And if you feel like he's just waiting to watch you fail or to fall, let me tell you, he is not like Icarus' dad at all. This is not the, the God of, of the Bible. Verse 3 says that God will, that God's will is for you and that he set you apart. That should encourage your heart today. God is for you, not against you. Verse 7 says he's called you not to be impure, meaning that he longs for your victory. In fact, so much so, he wants it more than you do. So we can trust him and call upon him. And finally, verse 8 says that, that he loves you enough to want to take up residency within you. I love being married to my wife. I spend a lot of my day with her, and I enjoy doing that. I don't know you guys, but I'm guessing I wouldn't want to spend every day of the rest of my life with you. <laughs> it's no offense to you. Some are even nodding. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because I'm fallible. I have my quirks, and I'm imperfect. But the Holy Spirit is not fallible. He is perfect. He is patient. He is loving, he is kind, he is tenderhearted. He's willing to take up residency with those of us who are imperfect and say, I can live with that, I can work with this, I can fix that. The question is, will you allow him to do so? It all stems from how we deal with the sin in our lives as to whether or not we're going to be effective in this process called sanctification that God uses so that we can reach the world. If you will seek the Lord's presence in closing, and understand the goal is fellowship with him. And humble yourself to his word. And submit to the authority of Christ. You will find God's help. And that, I believe, is a walk that is pleasing to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for this, this morning. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to preach a message that is so dear to my heart. Because, Lord, I came from a life of great affliction and hardship and addiction and to see your powerful spirit come into my heart and radically change this individual and then give me an opportunity to preach your word, Lord. That shows that you are an always rooting, loving, kind, encouraging God who wants to do a mighty work of not just transforming our lifestyle but transforming our very soul and dwelling with us and giving us hope and purpose. Lord, thank you for taking that refuge within us. Thank you for choosing to do that. And thank you for the perfect peace that enables us to be able to live with you. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, to us as a church, as a universal church. I pray, God, that we would go out in that knowledge and allow you to radically heal our sins. But first, we have to confess that We've been doing it ourselves. We've been doing it alone. We've been doing it in our own power. Humble ourselves. Submit to your word and allow your spirit to align us to be successful. That we would surrender to that and follow in faithfulness. And be victorious and see others come to know Christ through that miracle work that you're still, still doing today. We thank you for it. We ask for more. In your holy name, Christ. Amen.